all my life I've tried to put out of my mind what happened. I couldn't believe that it actually happened. She both loves them and then hates them. This is a woman without a soul. They did what the mother said and they didn't question what she wanted done. On October 27, 1993, the Sheriff's Office in Nevada County, California, receives a call from 23-year-old Terry Knorr. She had uh, told me that she had called authorities around the whole area. She felt they thought she was crazy because of the bizarre story she was telling. She described a, uh, a burning body off a roadway. I was familiar with a case like that. I was just afraid. I was afraid to say anything. But this is not a recent crime Terry Knorr recounts. It is a murder that happened nearly a decade earlier in neighboring Placer County. She had been trying to tell the story over a number of months to law enforcement agencies. We were... Um, very excited when we received the information because nobody else would know of this unless they had been absolutely there at the scene or had intimate knowledge of the crime. The original investigation started nine years earlier after a horrifying discovery. The citizen called the office at about 4.30 in the morning, told the dispatch center that there was a body burning alongside the highway. So our patrol units were dispatched and the fire was still going. And uh, she was, was laying right here, about 25 feet off the highway. The majority of her body had been burned. The clothing that she was wearing had been burned. Forensic experts determined gasoline had been poured on the victim. The left side of her face was about the only part of her body that did not burn in addition to her back and, and her, uh, of her legs because they were on the ground. There was absolutely no identification on this body. Uh, there was no, there were no witnesses that ever came forward. She had duct tape across her, uh, her cheeks and, and mouth and lips and she had duct tape uh, on her hands. Police found a collection of personal items, clothing, jewelry, and silverware. They also feared the life of a young child could be at risk. Diapers were located at the uh, crime scene. That was very surprising. We believe that possibly a young mother had been kidnapped, the child was stolen, uh, we might have had a serial killer on, on board in our area. The whole entire area was searched, but no baby was ever discovered. So for a long, long time, we wondered what the connection was with those diapers. The investigators felt that they had what we call a body dump. A composite photo of the victim was created but no one came forward to identify her. The coroner rules she was still alive when set on fire. The body was labeled Jane Doe, number 485884. This case was never a cold case for us. We would re revisit it from time to time. 
Terry Noor reveals Jane Doe was her 17-year-old sister, Susan. Up until this point, I had been chasing a ghost. And now I finally had something to put a name to. And that was extremely important. But Terry Noor has a lot more to tell. All my life, I've tried to put out of my mind what happened. I couldn't believe that it actually happened. She fears her own life is in danger. She was deathly afraid that she might be next. Terry Noor is terrified of her own mother. <music> Teresa Cross Noor was born in Sacramento, California in 1946 to Jim and Swanee Cross. In the late 1950s, uh, Jim was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And uh, as a result, he lost his job and uh, fell into a deep depression. Mom and older sister Rosemary supported the family, but there was tension at home. Uh, the mother always seemed to focus most of the attention on Teresa. When Teresa was just 14, her mother suffered a massive heart attack. Her mother unexpectedly died in her arms. And uh, uh, with that, she lost uh, the person in her life with whom she was probably uh, uh, the closest to. I think one of the main effects for uh, Teresa was uh, this question, uh, who will love me now? She had a uh, major depressive uh, uh, episode, which is a serious psychological condition. The loss of her mother profoundly affected Teresa's personality. Early uh, adolescent loss is often a foundation for borderline personality disorder, which is a very serious psychological condition. I think that uh, set a pattern for her that we see uh, throughout the rest of her life. More trauma soon followed. In effect, every sense of security that Teresa ever known was gone to flash. Teresa was attractive and knew it. She started using her sex appeal to manipulate men. And it's not uncommon for persons with a, a borderline personality dis disorder to use sex as a way of both attracting and then retaining people in their lives and exploiting them with, with that form of behavior. And uh, that uh, uh, puts her on the course of uh, uh, finding a man uh, who became her first husband. Within a year of losing her mother, Teresa was married and pregnant. And she uh, feels as though now she has got the stability that she has been lacking since her mother's death. 21-year-old Cliff Sanders was a farmhand from the rural community of Galt, California. But Galt is a small town in Sacramento County. It's a, sort of a, a little western town. A lot of people wear cowboy boots there. But Teresa's emotional needs and insecurity began to impact the relationship. The marriage quickly went downhill uh, because Teresa was jealous of whenever he would go anywhere, anybody he would talk to, you know, because she tried to keep a short leash on him. And as a result, the marriage crumbled. She was a control freak. Uh, she followed him around. She wanted to make sure that he didn't see other women. Teresa gave birth to his son. The following spring, she was pregnant again. But there was little to celebrate. Cliff had had enough. 
Being married to a person like Teresa would both be uh, uh, heaven and uh, and hell. Heaven when she was happy and and vivacious and and erotic and, and very sexy, but hell when when she would fly into her rages. And the terrorizing thing about it would be you wouldn't know what would kick her off. And no one could imagine the torment and terror that lay ahead. In October 1993, Terry Knorr calls police in California and reveals tragic secrets that have haunted her for nearly 10 years. The following day, I flew out to Salt Lake City and interviewed her for four hours, and she was very happy to know that something was going to be done. I was just afraid. Terry Knorr reveals that a body set on fire on the side of the road back in 1984 was her 17-year-old sister, Susan. But she has more dark secrets. There was another body uh, dumped by the edge of, of a small lake. That, uh, that was a young female. She was in a cardboard box. She had been bound. They were dumped almost a year apart from each other. And within about six miles, the girl in the, in the box, she was disposed of and bound in uh, different type ligatures. Uh, and, and so, it, although it's unusual to have two bodies like that dumped close by, we were not able to make any connection. The body was never identified at the time. A double homicide. But Terry reveals it was her older sister, 20-year-old Sheila. She was deathly afraid that she might be next. What, 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 what's gonna happen to me? Her mother, Teresa, was emotionally damaged by the death of her own mother in her arms. The key in, in borderline personality disorder is the fear of abandonment. You think I cheat on you every two minutes? It's you crazy. Did. Her mood swings were too much for husband, Cliff. You know, he'd been accused time and time again of infidelity. Uh, he, he was sick of dealing with the situation. He told Teresa he was done, he was leaving. Take something else with you, too. What? It was pretty clear that she calculated. She uh, uh, turned the safety off, she cocked the gun, she aimed the gun, he put his hand up to protect himself, and she shot him right through the wrist into the heart and killed him. To me, it was a, a clearly a murder. On August 30th, 1964, Teresa was tried for murder. Her lawyers maintained that it was self-defense and painted her as the real victim. A battered woman, pregnant with her second child. Despite the fact there was no evidence of any bruising or any beating or anything, she was able to uh, be styled that way by her attorney and uh, in front of the jury. On September 22nd, 1964, the jury delivered its verdict, not guilty. Not only was she found not guilty, but the jurors ran over and they put their arms around that poor little darling and hugged her and said, you poor darling, oh, how wonderful it is that you're off now, that you're away from that, that monster. But all was not what it seemed. She showed up in my office the very next day without the pregnancy spot to uh, reclaim the, the rifle. 
if a person walks out the door on a murder, you'd think that they would go home and just thank their lucky stars and just never want to go near the courthouse again. I mean, that, that shows the kind of person she was. And this was the way in which she sought to demean the prosecutor. The demeaning of men is a, a very common pattern in uh, uh, women with borderline personality disorders. Teresa's uh, acquittal for the murder of her husband gave her a sense that I can uh, uh, achieve what I want without uh, fear of the consequences. After the trial, Teresa moved into a small apartment in Rio Linda, California, and began dating with a new attitude. She basically started to use every man that came into her life, whether it be for a babysitter or financial support. And when she tired of him, she'd move on to another man. On March 13th, 1965, Teresa gave birth to her second child, Sheila. I think at this point in her life, where she would have been in her late adolescence, early adulthood, she did feel trapped uh, by the children, so uh, she leaves the children with others uh, as a way of, uh, of pursuing what she really wants to do, which is to go out and have fun and, and to be a young adult again. Teresa became pregnant a third time and married again to Robert Knorr. In 1966, Susan was born, followed soon after by William and Robert Jr. Five kids, but another marriage in trouble. Persons with borderline personality disorder, they don't learn from experience, and they keep repeating these same chaotic, unstable relationships time after time after time. Two months after her divorce was finalized with Robert, uh, Teresa, who was now in her mid-20s, uh, gave birth to her sixth child, uh, a baby girl whom she named Terry. The young mother knew how to make her ex suffer. Unfortunately, at that time, there wasn't the type of laws that they have today protecting a father's rights. So as a result, he never saw his children again. That was a very characteristic pattern for her. And she simply cut that person out of her life and out of her children's lives as well. The children then learned that if you get on the wrong side of Teresa, you too will be cut off. Changing in front of your brothers. Teresa's daughters now irritated her. Quiet! Terry told me that her mother did not like women, and she also did not like her daughters because they were women. Her looks were fading and the scales never lie. At one point she told me that she felt that her mother was becoming jealous of the, the daughters because they were young and attractive looking. Terry reveals to detectives that her mother turned to drink and life became a living hell. She'd throw steak knives or scissors at them. Life was bittersweet for her sons. She liked the two boys. She didn't abuse them very much at all, according to, to Terry. She used them to help her to carry out the physical abuse that she wanted to carry out. The boys, from when they were very, very young, they were taught to do whatever the mother wanted, and so that's what they, they did. What kind of mother would do that? 
things grew even more desperate. What makes borderline personality disorder persons dangerous is their impulsivity, their erratic behavior, their predisposition to violence. I believe that Teresa Knorr was a truly evil person. Uh, no signs of any empathy towards anyone in the family structure. This is a woman without a soul. In October 1993, detectives are struggling to come to terms with a bizarre story of extreme child abuse and a double homicide being described by a terrified woman. Terry called the police. She had finally found a way in which to deal with the terrors that she had experienced as a child. Terry Knorr's mother, Teresa, was unstable and more vicious than ever. Susan apparently was the first one targeted because she was the only one who uh, would talk back to her mother and in so doing become a competitor. Heavy drinking increased the madness. I think that was part of uh, her excessive drinking that Teresa had developed what's called a substance-induced psychotic disorder, where she really begins having delusions about the events that uh, surround her. Teresa ordered her sons to join her in inflicting pain. I think that the boys complied with Teresa in hitting their sister to uh, keep from being abused themselves. They also turn their sisters into objects as a way of keeping them from feeling guilty rather than humans being abused. Terry reveals her mother let the boys have after-school jobs and friends. But the girls were kept inside. They were indoctrinated into this highly dysfunctional family and a way of living, and it appeared was basically normal for them. I don't know what to do. Believe me, I've asked myself a hundred times, why didn't I just take my sisters and run? Terry discloses that her single parent mother wanted extra cash. In 1980, Sacramento police picked up 15-year-old Susan Knorr on suspicion of being a runaway and a prostitute. She begged them not to take her home and detailed the abuse. But mom proved a convincing liar. Her mother made Terry tell the authorities from Child Protective Services that there was no abuse going on in the home, that there were no problems, and that's what occurred, and Susan was eventually released back to the home. Susan's cry for freedom had proved a fatal mistake. Now, she was a prisoner with the boys on guard duty. They're still emotionally being controlled by the person that abused them. And that's probably what happened to, to both William and Robert. This is the neighborhood adjacent to the mobile home park and the apartment complex is where the Knorr family lived at uh, the time. The beatings and torment continued. 
There were forced feedings and terrifying bedtime stories to keep her kids in line. Which one of you is it going to be? Teresa believes that she was a good mother. She also, however, was very violent with them. And by giving the children both experiences, she taught the children that she could both give and take away her love. In June 1983, an argument got out of control. Susan was shot in the chest. The bullet didn't actually hit any vital organs. Terry told me her mother placed Susan in the bathtub and uh, worked on giving her care so that she could recover from this wound. Terry was ordered to help treat her sister. Teresa's sudden concern for her daughter's well-being reflected her instability. Teresa was able to, to shoot Susan and then turn right around and start treating her. Uh, because she did not have this capacity for seeing the consequences of her acts. She kept her in the bathtub for about a month, nursing her back to health. The children, conditioned by years of brutality, told no one. Yet Teresa had another side. She helped care for the sick and elderly at local nursing homes and hospitals. Persons with borderline personality disorder can function adequately in society. They can act as if they are uh, a good mother. They can act as if they are a good employee. Teresa Noor had battered, beaten, and shot her daughter Susan before nursing her back to health. What came next was almost impossible to believe. Get more Wicked Attraction online. In October 1993, Terry Noor is revealing to detectives the hell she endured as a child at the hands of her violent and manipulative mother, Teresa. At times, there were gifts, but only for some. She used the indulgences as a way of manipulating the children. Good mothers do these kinds of things. How could you think that I'm a bad mother? Are you serious? I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. No, you deserve it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, these are almost fun. Oh. Oh my gosh. I love you, boys. One minute she could be sweet and kind, and then the next minute she, she was this evil, devil-like woman. You never knew what you were going to get with her. She shot her daughter, Susan, then nursed her back to health, only to stab her in the back with a pair of scissors. Susan realized it's do or die. Susan was about to become 18, so her mother told her, that uh, you can leave on one condition, and that is I can take the bullet out because the mother was paranoid that uh, one day she'd go to a hospital and uh, they trace the bullet back to uh, uh, Teresa Noor. Susan reluctantly agreed. It was the only way to escape the madness.
In July 1984, Teresa performed amateur surgery to remove the incriminating evidence of her cruelty. She had Susan drink a bottle of whiskey and lay on the, um, the kitchen floor while the mother took a sharp knife and cut the bullet out of her back. Susan lapsed into a coma. Teresa gave her daughter uh, antibiotics, uh, ibuprofen, but uh, nothing seemed to work. Uh, she became lethargic, uh, her eyes turned yellow, and, and she eventually came to the point where she was unable to control her own bowels. Teresa insisted the other children ignore their sister. Susan was clothed in uh, diapers at that point in time to control her. She laid there in a prone position, face up, face down, but they just simply stepped over her. Teresa had had enough. Teresa had her two um, sons, William and Robert, pick Susan up off the floor one evening. Susan was still alive, but she was in, in very, uh, very, very poor condition. I do think at that time the boys, if they had wanted to, they were physically strong enough that they could have stopped their mother. The family began to drive towards the mountainous areas of Lake Tahoe. She wasn't conscious. And, uh, but she was still breathing. They placed her fully clothed alongside the road, along with all of her belongings. William set his sister on fire. The boys were able to get to the point of participating in the burning of Susan because by then they had become desensitized to the violence. They were simply disposing of the trash rather than burning a human being. Teresa carried all of her possessions which she had placed on two garbage bags. Why on earth would any mother raise a child to 17 years of age and then kill it and burn it? What kind of mother would do that? In her statement to police, Terry Knorr says she hoped the violence would stop, at least for a time. But as far as her mother was concerned, the devil had left one body and entered another. Her oldest daughter, Sheila. William and Robert, once again, were made to help their mother beat and torture. In June 1985, the torment reached its now inevitable conclusion. One day she started beating her and she uh, requested that uh, her sons assist her in beating her. And that they beat her severely and they placed her in a closet. The children were ordered never to open the door. She was in fact confined to a linen closet 16 inches by 24 at the most. Uh, was shelving. There was no place for her to either kneel, to sit, or to rest herself. Terry told me she was never able to, uh, to, to give Sheila any help. She had yelled and cried and pleaded for help during the, that time period, uh, but they simply turned the TV up louder. Talk back to me. Wait, wait! 
In 1993, Terry Noor tells police her sister Susan was shot and burned alive by their own mother, Teresa. Her other sister, Sheila, had been locked away in a tiny closet. The last thing that Robert heard was a thud. No one opened the closet uh, for a couple days. The smell of death was a problem. Acting on his mother's orders, William brought home a large box from his job at a local movie theater. And uh, the family then drove a second trip to Lake Tahoe. They dumped Sheila's body off the side of the highway. Only a few miles from where they disposed of Susan the year before. The police did not make any connection between the two murders. And the identities of the victims remained a mystery. Until Terry Noor came forward nine years later. For the first time, investigators are able to put names to the victims. They also now know why there was a diaper near Susan's charred remains. The regular beatings and sickness had left her incontinent. Two murders, and now panic set in. After Sheila's death, uh, Teresa became very paranoid. Because uh, in her mind, there, there was evidence inside that closet that could connect her to her daughter's death. So she actually ordered Terry to go inside to douse the, the entire place with flammable liquid and then light it on fire. Investigators suspected arson, but there was no one to question as the family was hiding in a motel. Terry, now 15, and afraid that she'd become mom's next victim, ran for her life. Terry did what she had to do in order to survive. That's why she ran away. She knew if she didn't, she could very well be next, and she probably would have been. Terry just wanted to get out of there. She wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. Robert lived with his mother for a time, but William moved in with a girlfriend. Friends offered Terry a safe haven. Nearly a decade on, with both murder files reopened, the challenge for investigators is to prove Terry's horrifying claims. They start with Susan. As we investigated this case, we were very frustrated because we cannot come across any tangible proof that Susan Nor in fact existed. There were no photo albums, there were no diaries. There was nothing at all that Susan could claim. Well, I believe that the mother wanted to dispose of Susan and all of her belongings so there would be no evidence or any, any remains of hers in the house at all. Schools were really important in this investigation. We had no pictures of Susan at that time, so we were requested to go through the yearbooks when she last attended. I found Susan's picture finally. That's still the only picture that survived any of uh, her childhood. Investigators determined the box in which Sheila was dumped came from a local movie theater. Employee records show a familiar name. William Knorr. We went to the crime um, 
lab in Sacramento at Department of Justice, and they processed the box for us and were able to lift prints of both William and Robert Knorr from the box itself. That in itself placed the two brothers at the scene of the crime. Authorities set out to arrest Teresa, Robert, and William. We found out that William was, was living in the local area and we arrested him. We also learned that uh, Robert was uh, in prison uh, in the state of Nevada. He was in prison for a different murder that had occurred. We had officers fly there with the, uh, the arrest warrant and uh, returned him to California. At first, William denies any involvement in his sister's deaths. After we laid the case out to him, the information we had, he did uh, eventually admit his responsibility in these two acts. I questioned him, you know, why he didn't just, you know, stop at some point, tell his mother no. And his response to me was, you didn't know what it was like to live in that house with my mother. You had no idea what it was like. I had to do what she wanted me to do. We asked that question several times during the investigation, why nobody would report it. And they simply said that's the way it was. William and Robert Knorr are both charged with murdering their sisters, Susan and Sheila. Police travel to Salt Lake City, Utah, where Teresa is now living under her maiden name and providing home care to an elderly woman. She was wearing makeup, she had on nice clothing, she had on a nice wig. Um, she seemed to be living uh, a pretty good life. Teresa Knorr is charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Prosecutors drop murder charges against the boys, but still hold them accountable. It would have been very difficult uh, to find a jury that would convict them of these two murders based upon the, the abuse that uh, they and the girls had received from their mother. William pled up to being what's called an accessory after the fact, after a crime has occurred, aiding somebody, which is a low-level felony. He receives a suspended prison sentence and is ordered to undergo intensive psychiatric therapy. Robert also pleads guilty to accessory after the fact, and something else bothers him. When I prepared Robert for the fact that he would come face to face with his mother, you know, um, in, in court, uh, he was terrified of it. The last thing in the world he wanted to do was ever to see his mother again. She hadn't seen him in maybe 10 years. Uh, she went into some hysterical trance. And, I mean, it scared the whole courtroom. I mean, can you imagine uh, whether it's you can say the devil or just derangement, however you characterize it, evil incarnate. Robert ended up with three years concurrent to a sentence in Nevada, so no additional time. Uh, Robert had actually said, uh, I grew up in an insane asylum, but none of us realized that it, that it was an insane asylum. Investigators believe the girls could have been saved. I feel at the time that these two killings occurred, they were physically strong enough that they could have stopped and not been involved. In court, Teresa's second husband had a message for her. I hope you burn in hell for what you did to my kids, woman. On October 17, 1995, Teresa Knorr pleads guilty to murdering 17-year-old Susan and 20-year-old Sheila. 
The prosecution's case is built around Terry's brave statements. But she is spared the trauma of having to come face to face with her mother. Teresa Knorr herself offers no explanation. Her lawyer claims she's remorseful and for years led a bizarre, chaotic, and crazy life marked by heavy drinking and untreated mental illness. The judge tells Knorr her crimes showed a callousness almost beyond belief and sentences Knorr to two consecutive life terms. She will not be eligible for parole until 2027, at the age of 80. For Teresa's only remaining daughter, Terry, the guilt remains. I just want my sisters to, to, to know that I had nothing to do with this and I love them. And they're gone now and I don't have them. And I want them back. I know that Terry had a lot of hatred for her mother because of what she, she did. What kind of person am I going to be throughout the rest of my life because of this? That's what I want to know. How am I going to deal with this? What's, what, what, what's going to happen to me? In 2003, Terry Knorr suffered a fatal heart attack. She was just 32 years old. I'm sure that she had had many, many nights of uh, terrible nightmares. Terry Knorr recounts, it is a murder that happened nearly a decade earlier in neighboring Placer County. She had been trying to tell the story over a number of months to law enforcement agencies. We were um, very excited when we received the information because nobody else would know of this unless they had been absolutely there at the scene or had intimate knowledge of the crime. The original investigation started nine years earlier after a horrifying discovery. The citizen called the office at about 4.30 in the morning, told the dispatch center that there was a body burning alongside the highway. So our patrol units were dispatched and the fire was still going. And uh, she was, was laying right here, about 25 feet off the highway. The majority of her body had been burned. The clothing that she was wearing had been burned. Forensic experts determined gasoline had been poured on the victim. The left side of her face was about the only part of her body that did not burn in addition to her back and, and her, uh, of her legs because they were on the ground. There was absolutely no identification on this body. Uh, there was no, there were no witnesses that ever came forward. Terry Knorr has a lot more to tell. All my life I've tried to put out of my mind what happened. I couldn't believe that it actually happened. She fears her own life is in danger. She was deathly afraid that she might be next. Terry Knorr is terrified of her own mother.
Teresa Cross Knorr was born in Sacramento, California in 1946 to Jim and Swanee Cross. In the late 1950s, uh, Jim was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And uh, as a result, he lost his job and uh, fell into a deep depression. Mom and older sister Rosemary supported the family, but there was tension at home. Uh, the mother always seemed to focus most of the attention on Teresa. When Teresa was just 14, her mother suffered a massive heart attack. Her mother unexpectedly died in her arms, and uh, uh, with that, she lost uh, the person in her life with whom she was probably uh, uh, the closest to. I think one of the main effects for uh, Teresa was uh, this question, uh, who will love me now? She had a uh, major depressive uh, uh, episode. All my life I've tried to put out of my mind what happened. I couldn't believe that it actually happened. She both loves them and then hates them. This is a woman without a soul. They did what the mother said, and they didn't question what she wanted done. On October 27, 1993, the Sheriff's Office in Nevada County, California, receives a call from 23-year-old Terry Knorr. She had uh, told me that she had called authorities around the whole area. She felt they thought she was crazy because of the bizarre story she was telling. She described a, uh, a burning body off a roadway. I was familiar with a case like that. I was just afraid. I was afraid to say anything. But this is not a recent crime. Which is a serious psychological condition. The loss of her mother profoundly affected Teresa's personality. Early uh, adolescent loss is often a foundation for borderline personality disorder, which is a very serious psychological condition. I think that uh, set a pattern for her that we see uh, throughout the rest of her life. More trauma soon followed. In effect, every sense of security that Teresa ever known was gone to flash. Teresa was attractive and knew it. She started using her sex appeal to manipulate men. And it's not uncommon for persons with a, a borderline personality dis disorder to use sex as a way of both attracting and then retaining people in their lives and exploiting them with, with that form of behavior. And uh, that uh, uh, puts her on the course of uh, uh, finding a man uh, who became her first husband. Within a year of losing her mother, Teresa was married and pregnant. And she uh, feels as though now she has got the stability that she has been lacking since her mother's death. 21-year-old Cliff Sanders was a farmhand from the rural community of Galt, California. 
she had duct tape across her uh, her cheeks and, and mouth and lips, and she had duct tape uh, on her hands. Police found a collection of personal items, clothing, jewelry, and silverware. They also feared the life of a young child could be at risk. Diapers were located at the uh, crime scene. That was very surprising. We believe that possibly a young mother had been kidnapped, the child was stolen, uh, we might have had a serial killer on, on board in our area. The whole entire area was searched, but no baby was ever discovered. So for a long, long time, we wondered what the connection was with those diapers. The investigators felt that they had what we call a body dump. A composite photo of the victim was created but no one came forward to identify her. The coroner rules she was still alive when set on fire. The body was labeled Jane Doe, number 485884. This case was never a cold case for us. We would re revisit it from time to time. Terry Noor reveals Jane Doe was her 17-year-old sister, Susan. Up until this point, I had been chasing a ghost. And now I finally had something to put a name to. And that was extremely important. But 